All right. Hi, everybody. I want to start off by saying that I am not profiting in any way off of this. This is done purely for education. And of course, it's uh, always fun for me to talk about orthopedics. And uh, this is meant for people who are out there on the front lines, like ER doctors and uh, nurses and other people, um, people in primary care who may be dealing with um, uh, musculoskeletal issues. And uh, this is to kind of give you a sense of how um, an x-ray is read and what we look for in terms of uh, triage and management of basic um, shoulder problems. I won't talk about every possible shoulder problem here, but I'll talk about the two that people come to the emergency room the most for, and those are shoulder dislocations and proximal humerus fractures. Um, so the basics of reading a shoulder x-ray, first uh, you need to know that there's a couple of different views that we look for as orthopedic surgeons. This is just your standard AP view of the shoulder. And there's a couple of things to notice here. Number one, um, you will see some overlap, which is outlined here nicely. Um, this is a picture I just took all off uh, the internet. All of these pictures are available um, publicly in the public domain. So I just chose the ones that I thought were the most um, uh, illustrative uh, of what I wanted to show. So this nicely shows the overlap between the humeral head and the glenoid. So that's the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder joint. Um, it shows certain other things that you will be able to easily see on an AP view. So you want to look at the clavicle. The clavicle is meant to have this shape. It's got a curved S shape, which is why it doesn't really look flat or straight. Um, and this line here is normal. This is not a fracture. Um, this is the acromioclavicular joint, so the AC joint. Um, the only thing you really need to know about it if you're just triaging stuff is that it is supposed to be fairly collinear um, if uh, there is a separation and we often get called for AC separations you can just put it in a sling and have it follow up as an outpatient um, the only exception is really when it's threatening the skin and it is threatening to become an open fracture um, this is the acromion so that is the most lateral projection of the scapula which is the shoulder blade you can see the scapula here and it's uh, the the x-ray doesn't really show the most inferior portion of it um, but uh, it's made of a couple of parts and the things to notice on an AP view is the coracoid, which is its anterior projection. Um, it is the site of the uh, coracoclavicular ligaments and some other ligaments. Um, but basically, you notice that it is a circle because it projects forward. Um, then if you kind of follow it, you get down to the glenoid, which is really an oval surface. You can't really see uh, it well on here, and I'll show you some other views in which you can see it better. And then, of course, the proximal humerus. And just like any long bone, it has a shaft. It's got a metaphysis, which is sort of the cancellous bone kind of in between um, the uh, shaft and the joint surface. So this is the metaphysis, and then this is the articular or joint surface. Now, obviously, you cannot see the cartilage on an x-ray, but you can see uh, the bone. Um, there is a classification for proximal humerus fractures called the near classification, which I'm not going to go into, but it divides the proximal humerus into several parts. And when you're treating these fractures, it's important to understand um, what exactly is broken. Uh, but here on an AP view, you just want to make sure that everything is um, where it's supposed to be, that there's no uh, obvious fractures in the scapula, the glenoid, or the proximal humerus. But this isn't really the x-ray to me as a trauma surgeon that is the most useful. The one that is the most useful to me is actually called uh, the Grashy view, spelled G-R-A-S-H-E-Y. And this is the Grashy view. And you see it it, it's very different than the AP view because now you can see the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder joint sort of on foss. And basically the reason for that is, is that uh, there's uh, the, the glenoid is angled. And so if you aim your x-ray beam exactly um, in line with that joint, you can actually see the articulation much better. And this is the view that I prefer. So if I see patients in clinic and they only have an AP view of the shoulder, um, I want to get a good sense of how the proximal humerus lines up uh, with the glenoid, and this is the view I will get. So the Grashy view um, is really important. Um, it uh, gives you also a good sense of the shape of the proximal humerus. So its articular surface, its head sort of points upwards a little bit, and uh, there's the greater and lesser tuberosities. The lesser one is really not uh, very well visualized because it's kind of um, it, it's kind of overlaps with the rest of the bones. But the greater um, tuberosity, you can see it uh, quite well here. Um, and if you notice, the most important thing to know if you look at a proximal humerus on the Grashy view is that it is asymmetrical, meaning one side will 
be different looking from the other side. It is not supposed to be symmetrical, and I will um, tell you why um, in a few minutes. Um, and the other uh, view that I consider uh, the most important, so if I were to get any two views, I would get the Gresci, and then the scapular Y view, or the standard lateral. And so this is the scapular Y view. The reason it's called the Y view is because the scapula is shaped like a Y. So this is the acromion. This is that projection that we saw. This is the AC joint. So the acromion is in the back, so that's how you know that's posterior, that's anterior, and this is the coracoid right here jutting out. And the glenoid is not very well seen because the humeral head is overlapped, but it's basically a little oval right in the center here, right in the center of that Y. And then the bottom part of the Y is the body of the scapula and you can see it here. You can actually see its other projection as it goes to the medial side um, down over there. Um, within this, uh, the proximal humerus um, can really, uh, depending on the position of the arm, it can really be in any direction. So you don't really pay too much attention to what's going on with the shaft. It can point here, it can point straight, it can point back. It doesn't really matter where the shaft is. What a what really um, is important is where the head is. And the humeral head must be somewhere within the region of uh, the glenoid. So it's got to be in the center of that Y. If it's not, you suspect a shoulder dislocation, and I'll show you what that looks like. So that's really what we're looking for here. Nothing nothing uh, too major, um, and uh, in most patients, you can easily uh, get this view. The other view that people like to get is the axillary view, and uh, this is done um, basically shooting into the armpit, and the point of this is to really um, take a look at the shoulder joint and to make sure that, uh, thing, that the humeral head is not uh, dislocated. So you can see the glenoid here, the humeral head here, you see the coracoid here, so you know right away that's anterior, so that's the front of the body. Um, the acromion you can't really see too well because in this picture it over overlaps. Sometimes um, you can see it much uh, um, much more prominently, but here it's kind of overlapping with the humeral head, but you don't really pay much attention to what's going on over here. The only thing you really need to see is that the humeral head is sitting nicely in that glenoid, so there's congruence here in the joint, and you're not suspecting anything else. Now, a caveat about the axillary view, there's been some literature um, out there that shows that if you have a proximal humerus fracture, do not get an axillary view because all you're doing is you're moving the shaft, and the shaft isn't really connected to the humeral head at that point. So all you're doing is really torturing the patient. And it is not, um, the axillary review is not actually shown in the literature to uh, correlate with final outcome or final position um, in proximal humerus fractures. So if I have a particularly um, painful shoulder, but I, you know, I want to see, is it fracture or is it a fracture dislocation? You know, is the humeral head okay? And I don't want to torment the patient with um, an axillary view. There's a substitute view that you can do, and it is called the Velpo, and it is done like this. So right here, you have the patient kind of lean backwards, um, and uh, shoot straight down. Um, your radiology techs uh, should be able to do this. And it gives you sort of like a poor man's version of the axillary view. And this is what you can see with it. And I know this picture is really small, so I'm sorry. Um, I couldn't really find a better view. But you see the glenoid right here. And you can see uh, the humeral head here. And it shows you here that the uh, humeral head is located, that it's not um, going one way or the other. So that is your poor man's axillary. And that um, is the one I prefer uh, for proximal humerus fractures. Now, if I have any doubt about whether a shoulder has both a fracture and a dislocation, and I cannot tell using a plain radiography, just get a CAT scan, and then you will have your answer. Um, now, going on to shoulder dislocations, uh, the vast majority that are seen in the emergency room are anterior dislocations, meaning the humeral head is in the front of the glenoid. Um, this is your very classic um, example of a shoulder dislocation right here. So this is an x-ray, and it's not just anterior. It kind of drops down a little bit, so it's anterior inferior. So you can see um, it's a little bit blurry here, but you can see the glenoid right there, and you can clearly tell that the humeral head is nowhere near where it is supposed to be. Now, be now theoretically, could this be um, in the back of the glenoid? Like, how do you know it's in the front? Well, we know it's in the front because it's inferior, and that's generally where they are. They kind of go down. So this is an anterior shoulder dislocation. Um, you look and you don't see any fractures, um, and this is um, very... Um, um, 
amenable to reduction, particularly if it hasn't been, you know, a couple of days or a very long time and the patient's all locked up. Now, before you try and reduce this, you want to make sure that you examine the x-ray very carefully to make sure there's no fractures, particularly in a young person. Um, if you have a non-displaced fracture and you try and yank on this and you can reduce it, but you might actually complete the fracture and then you'll disrupt the blood supply to the humeral head and then um, that young person is going to end up with a shoulder replacement because the head will go on to die. So, um, and that's obviously a very um, sad um, and very quite litigious uh, situation as well. So you always want to make sure that there are no uh, fractures um, on that x-ray. So, um, so you have the shoulder dislocation. Um, the way to, you know, you don't, you don't, ever really want just one view, so you want to verify it with another view to make sure it truly is an anterior dislocation. This is kind of what you will see, so this is your normal scapular Y, and as you can tell now, th this time the shaft is pointing posteriorly. Again, this is completely normal. You don't care about what the shaft is doing, you only care about what this is doing, so the humeral head is right here, and so that's what you want to be, that's what you want to be looking at. And then in this view, you can clearly tell that the shoulder um, is not, uh, not right. You have the glenoid and it's totally empty and you have the humeral head kind of sitting anterior. Again, anterior because the coracoid is here, um, the acromion is here, so it is um, going out there in the front. So you know this shoulder is very much dislocated. Um, now I want to show you this x-ray and this is the issue with getting AP views because you can be really fooled. So this is a dislocation as well. This is a posterior dislocation um, and it has a couple of classic signs, um, but uh, the most important thing to recognize is that um, the shoulder is not the proximal humerus is symmetrical looking. So when I talked about the shape of the proximal humerus in a previous picture, so right here, so you remember that the humerus is not supposed to be symmetrical. You're supposed to see the greater tuberosity out here laterally. You're supposed to see the humeral head. Now if you look again at this picture and you see this doesn't really look uh, very asymmetrical. It kind of, I mean, there's a couple of shadows over here, but for the most part, this looks pretty even. Um, and these are very, very frequently missed. And uh, this is why, because especially on an AP view where you don't have a grashy view and you don't see the incongruence in the joint, um, this may look quite normal and it is often read as normal. So um, if the radiologist does not pick this up, it, it kind of um, falls on you um, to, uh, to see that uh, there's something wrong and the patient won't be able to move their shoulder in a certain way and will have a persistent pain and it is up to you to try um, and make sure that you catch this because um, late uh, posterior dislocations that are picked up late and that are not reduced have very, very bad outcomes. Um, so uh, basically this symmetry the symmetry of the proximal humerus, it's called the light bulb sign because it looks like a light bulb. So if you see this, be very, very, very suspicious for a dislocation. And so in those cases, you know, you obviously want some other view here. And then, so here is a um, here is a uh, lateral scapular Y view, and even here it doesn't even look completely abnormal. But um, if you extrapolate this Y, so here's the top part of the Y, here's the bottom. So the glenoid's supposed to be kind of right here. And you see this is not really, it's not really here where it's supposed to be. It's kind of in the back, again, because this is coracoid, that's acromion, so this is posterior. That's in the back, so that's that's very, very suspicious. Now in these cases, if the patient can tolerate, you can get an axillary or a Velpo, and very often you will see something like this. So this uh, is an axillary view and you can see there's the glenoid right here and this is the humeral head and you see it right in the back. So it is supposed to be up here and it is not. So it's in the back. Um, and over here you can even see that it is locked, uh, which often, which uh, very often happens. This is uh, called a hill sax uh, lesion. And so as the humerus goes back and tries to, um, and tries to, uh, um, 
you know, get back to where it originally was, uh, the humeral head, because the, the bone is softer there, gets kind of embedded on the glenoid and locked. So it's important to, you know, for us when we're trying to reduce this, to try and uh, recreate the deformity a little bit so that you can unlock that humeral head from uh, behind the glenoid and then sort of lift it up and get it uh, to where it's supposed to be. Um, but again, if you have any doubts whatsoever, just get a CAT scan. Don't try and yank on this unless you know what you're, what you're looking at. The other type of dislocation, which is very rare, and I've only seen it a few times in my career, is this. This is an inferior dislocation. So kind of like an anterior inferior uh, dislocation, but you see the, that um, it looks very different from the anterior dislocation because the humeral shaft is pointing straight up. So this is called luxatio erecta, and it's a pretty rare injury. As I said, I've only seen it a couple of times, and it, it requires uh, a little bit more finesse to reduce. So don't, I, I personally would call orthopedics for this. I would not try and reduce this yourself unless you're, you're very um, adventurous. Um, but the point is, is not just to yank down on the arm because you're going to lock this up and then you're going to fracture uh, the humeral neck. So you don't want to be doing that. Um, but it has a very specific presentation in which the patient's arm will be pointing straight up and they will be unable to lower that. Um, in all the other shoulder dislocations, the patient's arm is kind of at the side of their body. So that's it for dislocations. And now we're going to say a quick word about proximal humerus fractures. And I'm not going to go into the classifications that we as orthopedic surgeons use or sort of various treatments. I could spend like an hour on this. Um, but these come in all sorts uh, of varieties. And no matter how they show up to your ER, even if they look like this, um, they are not emergencies. You don't have to do anything except put them in a sling and send them to the orthopedic surgeon who will then determine whether they can be treated operatively operatively or non-operatively. And believe it or not, if this is an elderly person, this can very well be treated non-operatively. And yes, they will be stiff, um, but uh, this bone will heal. Um, and I have seen it. Um, but I wouldn't make any recommendations to the patient like, oh yeah, you're definitely going to need surgery because then um, we are in the clinic and we are kind of, um, you know, dealing with a patient who is here expecting to get a surgical procedure. And then we tell them, well, no, you do not need surgery or you, you don't necessarily need surgery. And they're like, well, the other doctor said blah, blah, blah. So try and avoid um, telling people what they do or do not need. Just leave that to us. Say, you know, you might need surgery, but I'm not sure. Um, well, let's send you to the orthopedic and we'll see what they think. Um, so with regard to these proximal humerus fractures in um, the uh, emergency room, um, there's really not that much you need to do. Um, you can put them in a sling. Um, you should restrict their shoulder motion. They're not going to want to move it. Um, a lot of the time they're going to be quite swollen and um, the bruising can extend. And you can tell the patient this, that over the next few days, the bruising um, and the black and blues that they're going to have can extend all the way down to their elbow, their hand, and even their forearm arm can be swollen and that's all completely normal and it takes weeks and weeks to uh, resolve. Um, the only thing to really say um, until they see the orthopedic surgeon is that they need to come out of the sling three times a day to move their elbow because elbows love to get stiff. So if somebody is in pain and doesn't want to move, um, then they show up in the office um, you know, it, you know, God forbid they, um, they can't get in or something happens and they stay locked up in that sling, um, for a week, it's very hard for them to get their elbow motion back. So three times a day for elbow, wrist and digits range of motion. And their goal should be, um, to straighten out their elbow all the way and then nothing with the shoulder. And we will take care of it from there. Um, there uh, is also something I wanted to talk about in terms of fracture dislocations and uh, sort of the nuances around that. And I wanted to show you this x-ray right here. And we often get called for this, um, saying that this is a, that we have a fracture dislocation of the proximal humors. So just just uh, to be clear, fracture dislocations of a proximal humerus are extremely rare, particularly if the person is elderly, they will either sustain a uh, fracture or a dislocation. It's very rarely both. Now, if you have a high energy car accident, a younger patient or things like that, yes, it certainly is possible. And as I uh, have said several times now in this video, if you have any um, doubts whatsoever, just get a CAT scan and then you'll be able to see the glenoid. Um, now this, um, 
Now this is a Grashi view and uh, you see that there is definitely incongruence between the glenoid and the humeral head. And you look at this and you're like, oh, well, that's definitely suspicious for a dislocation, but this is not in fact a dislocation. This is called a pseudo subluxation. And I have unfortunately seen um, uh, the um, emergency room physicians um, basically treat this as a dislocation and attempt to reduce it. And you cannot reduce it because it's not dislocated. This is a fracture and the head has um, subsided a little bit, but basically this is due to um, buildup of uh, blood from hematoma from the fracture site in the glenohumeral joint, which pushes things down a little bit and also muscle paralysis uh, from the fracture. So uh, the shoulder does not really have um, uh, major attachments that keep it in place. It's entirely dependent um, on the rotator cuff and these other soft tissue structures that kind of keep it in place, which is why it is such a, um, a such a flexible joint. You know, we can move our arm pretty much anywhere. Um, but the downside to that is that if the muscles like kind of uh, freeze up, then the shoulder will just sag. And again, this is not a dislocation. And I've kind of witnessed some unfortunate events in which um, the emergency room physicians thought that this was a dislocation and yanked on uh, the spine poor uh, old lady for um, hours and hours thinking uh, that uh, they could reduce it and then finally called and said, oh, you know, we can't reduce it. Can you come and help? So again, not a dislocation. Treat this as a proximal humeral fracture, leave it alone, put it in a sling and send it to the orthopedist. And again, any doubts, get a CAT scan. Um, the only time really is when uh, these become emergent. Now, granted, if you have an issue with neurovascular, something um, something really bothering you, it's never a bad idea to call us and to say, hey, you know, can you look at this? Uh, or, you know, I'm really concerned. Can you come take a look at the patient? But there is one instance um, in my experience where, um, where this does become an emergency and it actually uh, becomes a surgical emergency is when you have an x-ray that looks like this. Um, so this is a fracture dislocation. Um, it is a proximal human humerus fracture, but you see here the humeral head, not only is it kind of nowhere near, um, so unlike the above x-ray, yeah, the humeral head subsided, but it's still kind of within the region of the joint, um, or in this fracture, it's still up here, whereas the shaft is somewhere else, but the head itself is within the joint. In this x-ray, um, it is basically in the axilla, it's in the armpit, and neurovascular structures, um, including all the blood supply to the arm, passes through this area. So if the humeral head is in the axilla like this, um, this um, requires a very, very thorough uh, neurologic and vascular examination, and you should not be sending this home. This requires um, an emergent evaluation by an orthopedic surgeon, and uh, very often um, this gets taken to the operating room, maybe not that night, but certainly early the next morning, in order to reduce this head. Um, I have only seen this reduced successfully in a closed uh, reduction uh, once, um, um, where basically you had the surgeon pushing on this and milked it out of the axilla back into the glenohumeral joint. But in reality, um, it is very, very difficult, even when you open it, even when you make the incision, to fish that humeral head out of there. Um, so the, suc the success rate of closed reduction for this is extremely low. Um, so again, for this one, you really want to make sure you keep the patient NPO and you call orthopedics immediately. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening.